as I reflect, I find perspective. You're in the best and worst days of his life. You were always on my side. You're in the pain, you're in the promise. And on the days the furnace finds my faith, you're the fourth within the flame. Cause if the past could talk, it would tell me this My God isn't finished yet If He did it before, He can do it again So I trust Him with what comes next For the God I know is known for faithfulness Yeah, my heart sad says I can trust Him
Psalm 23, six, surely his goodness and his mercy will follow you all the days of your life. We may not always see it. We may not always recognize it, but his good truly is running after us. You know, if you uh, are new to our church, in this past December, we, uh, were, we, we, we did a campaign. It's called the Press On Campaign. Uh, our church was really just hoping to serve uh, many people in a part of our, as part of our community, those beyond our church community uh, who's struggling just with some, some emotional anxiety, depression, anything along those lines, people who, who could use some, some help of some professional counselors. And we recognize that many people need that help but just don't have the financial means to make that happen for them in their lives. So you as a church, like you always do, you generously gave to this campaign, raising so much money so that thousands and thousands and thousands of people could go get this help. One story from, from our campus is a, a young guy, he's in his 20s, struggled with drugs for a long time. His grandma and grandpa go to church here uh, and they've been praying for him since birth. Just recently in the past year, he, he wants to get a fresh start. He moved out of his, his, his environment he was in, moved in with his grandpa and grandma. Of course, when he moved in with them, they started bringing him to church. And it was during the press on campaign that he finally like raised his hand. He said, I'm ready to get some help. We got him connected with counselors. He started talking with, uh, with one of our pastors. And through all of that, man, his life has really changed. He got he accepted Christ. He was baptized. And his aunt and uncle are like watching this whole thing take place. And they're like, this, our nephew, like he is not the same guy he used to be. I think we want whatever it is he's having. And so last weekend, his aunt and uncle came to Easter and also made the decision to accept Christ and get baptized. God's goodness, it's all around us. And the reason I share that story, one is because it's an incredible story, but secondly, is because that story doesn't happen without you. God works most powerfully in the context of his community more than he ever could in any individual. Through your involvement, through how you gave to Press On Campaign, that family's story is also our story. And as we approach this time of communion, you know, most weeks as we, as we think about celebrating communion where we remember what Christ has done for us, we typically approach it just in a very individualistic way, you know, making sure like my life is right with God. And uh, rightfully so, that's what we should do. But it's not just that. In this time where we remember Christ's body and his sacrifice represented by the bread and the juice, we also remember the words of the Apostle Paul that says, you, we are the body of Christ. And as much as God just wants to, 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 to show you and tell you and remind you in this moment that you matter to him, I think he also wants us to remind you that you not only matter to him, but you're also needed in his community, in his church, to continue to make a difference in the lives of people in this community, in your lives. So as we celebrate communion, for those of you that are new with us, we'll share some more instructions on our screen. We invite all followers of Christ to join us. May we lean in to not only what God's done for us, but what God is calling us to. God, we thank you for this reminder of, of the life that we have with you that was made possible through Jesus' death and resurrection. God, as we remember what he's done, what he's given to us, God, may we also strive to follow his lead and look to serve those around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, I am so glad you're here this weekend. And before I get right into the message, I thought it would be a, just appropriate for us to celebrate all that God did this past weekend at Easter at CCV. You know, our theme was Welcome Home. And it was quite a, quite a homecoming here at CCV. Some of you came back to church for the first time in a long time. And I, I wanna say welcome back. I really wanna challenge you to stay committed, consistent, Every weekend, that's one of the best ways you can grow in your faith. Uh, you need to know that across all 12 of our campuses, we had just over 54,000 people attend a, an Easter experience, which is really just a, a move of God that we're so thankful for. But the most important thing we have to celebrate is the 1,103 people that gave their lives to Jesus and were baptized, and we can celebrate that. It's just you, you need to know, <laughs> every one of those has a name and a story. And I could spend 30 minutes telling you stories that, that I've just heard, and I haven't heard all of them, but I could tell you about the 17-year-old who the day before Easter had decided to commit suicide and take his life and came to an experience here at CCV with his mom and decided to give his life to Jesus and has, has hope again. He has real hope. I could tell you about the couple I met that is uh, married, has two young kids, and they told me that on the day before they came to an Easter service, they gave their rings back to each other. And they said, we're getting a divorce. And on Easter, they realized that they didn't have Jesus. And they turned their lives over to Jesus and they were baptized. You can see, see hope in their eyes again. They have some work to do, but there's, there's hope now. Jesus is with them. And just, just today, I heard about a, a woman who had been in a five-year physically abusive relationship. She was abused by her husband, and she got out of that relationship, and she'd only been coming to CCV for two weeks. She came on Easter, and she said, it was my chance to come home, to have a fresh start. CCV, God is on the move, and let's just give him all the glory and credit for what he's doing. Yeah. Well, this weekend we start a brand new series, and I thought I'd just start with a question. When's the last time in your life that you felt stuck? You know, maybe it was you felt stuck in a job, maybe you felt stuck in a relationship and a marriage, just in life. You know, I'm, I'm a movement forward kind of guy, really impatient, I love movement. So the idea of being stuck, to me, is like one of the worst things in the world. And I was thinking about the last time I really, really got stuck, and the, the thing that popped in my mind is, there was, this was a few years ago, I, I owned this little truck, and there was a bunch of traffic, and I, I saw this dirt field, and I thought, well, I'll just cut through that dirt field, and you'll pass all the traffic. I know, I shouldn't have done it, but I'm just confession time. Okay, I, I cut through this dirt field, and as I'm going through it, I came upon this really sandy area, deep sand, and my truck got completely stuck in the sand. I mean, I'm literally, the harder I push the pedal, the more the wheels are just spinning deeper into the sand. I am completely stuck, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. No one's all around. You ever felt like you're just spinning your wheels in life? You wanna know how I got out of the sand? I'm not gonna tell you till later in the message, all right? But I will tell you, but I wonder how many of us feel stuck in our faith. You ever been there? You know, you, maybe you stopped believing at some point. For a lot of us, you didn't stop believing. What happened was you, you still believed, you just didn't feel any forward progress in your faith anymore. You know, for example, there, there was probably a time period in your life that, that you know, your prayer life was vibrant. You were praying to God and you'd get into God's word and just felt like God was really speaking to you. Things were jumping off the page. You know, you're consistent in church. You're, you're sharing your faith with other people around you. I mean, your faith is just humming. And then something happened. And sometimes you're not even sure what, but things just slowed down. It was like, it was like the flame on a candle that just kind of slowly started going out and all of a sudden, you know, you weren't praying anymore. You know, Bible reading was like a chore. You didn't even get anything out of it and you stopped coming to church. You just kind of, got, other things got in the way and, and when it came to sharing your faith, I mean, you're, you're not sharing your faith. You're, you're living your life. You ever, you ever felt stuck? This series this series is for anyone that's ever felt stuck. And maybe you feel that way right now, or you wanna avoid it in the future. And so what we're gonna do throughout this series is we're gonna talk about some of the big 
questions that I think get people stuck. Because what happens to some of us is there's some big questions that pop up, even about God, and, and what happens is we don't have the answers. Or the answers we were given as kids don't hold up to the rigors of adulthood now. And so we're gonna talk about six big questions over the next six weeks that, that I think get people stuck, and we're gonna dive deep. We're gonna talk about you know, questions like, why would a good God allow something bad to happen to good people? You ever, you ever wondered what, like why would that happen? We're gonna talk about that. Week six, we're gonna talk about, doesn't one way to God through Jesus, doesn't that seem a little narrow? We're gonna talk about several others, but as we start this series today, and by the way, I think it's a great series to invite someone new to. As we start this series today, I wanna just talk to you initially about two reasons people get stuck in their faith. Two initial reasons, and I hope you're taking notes. Here's reason number one. We get stuck in our faith when we try out faith instead of training in faith. In other words, what we want is we want a growing faith with no cost. Now don't raise your hands, but how many of you have ever said, you know what, this is the year I'm gonna start working out. I'm gonna get healthy, I'm gonna get fit. You know, maybe at the beginning of this year you did that. Some of you did that when Rich Froning came to CCV, right? You looked at him and you're like, I'm gonna get ripped like him. You know, I mean, you're like, I'm gonna get buff. And so you tried, you tried to start working out and getting fit. And then what happened? You just kind of fizzled out. What'd you do? You tried, you didn't train. You didn't start training. And what I want you to hear today is this. Trying can never match the power of training. And sometimes we're just, I think in America, we're addicted to trying. I mean, trying's like eating one piece of broccoli and wanting to lose 10 pounds, right? I mean, trying's like buying a lottery ticket and thinking that's gonna fix all your financial issues that have built up over time versus training. Well, that seems hard. Trying is like doing one nice thing for your spouse and expecting all the things you've been dealing with in the past to just go away. We have to get into training mode. And it's amazing to me in scripture how much we're told that we have to train train to grow in our faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 25 says this. It says, do you not know that in a race, this is Paul talking about our faith, he's comparing it to a race. He says, in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. He says, here's how I want you to live out your faith. I want you to run in such a way that you get the prize. You're gonna progress and win. How do you do that? He says this, he's listen, everyone, everyone that competes in the games, goes into strict training. So he's like, if you wanna grow in your faith, you have to train. I love this verse in Proverbs, just for us parents. I mean, listen to this. You, wanna, you want your kids to grow up to be godly, godly kids? Well, train up a child in the way he should go. Train, train, train. And even when he's old, he won't depart from it. It's a basic principle. You, you ever watched a parent try versus train with a child? All of us have observed this, okay? You're like, what are you talking about? Have you ever seen a parent try? What's happening? Their kid's acting up and they start saying things like this. Timmy, Timmy, you stop it. Stop it right now. Stop it, Timmy. Stop it. Knock it off. And then they just escalate. I said, stop it. If you don't stop right this minute, we will leave this restaurant. I swear we will leave this restaurant. Keeps doing it. Timmy, I'm gonna give you one last chance. One last chance. Keeps doing it. Okay, this is the final straw. Stop it, right? Then it's like, let me go to bargaining. Timmy, would you, if I give you a piece of candy, will you please stop, you know? <laughs> you ever seen a parent do this? What are they doing? They're trying. What is training? Training is doing the hard work of backing up your actions as a parent with your words. Why well, do I want to leave the restaurant? That seems inconvenient. Do you want to train your child? We fell into that as parents. I mean, we had to get into massive training mode. Let me, let me talk to you, those of you in a relationship. Maybe you're married here today. You ever, you ever tried to be a sp good spouse instead of training to be a good spouse? This was me for about the first five years of my marriage, I think. And I, I've had seasons since then that I've fallen into this. I was trying to be a good husband. I wasn't training. And it wasn't until I started training that things changed. 
What do I mean? I started reading books. I really dug into books and tried to apply what I was learning to my life. Jamie and I made a commitment that we try to go to a marriage conference once a year to start training in our marriage. It doesn't happen by accident. I started being mentored by older men that were further along in their marriage. Jamie and I started going to counseling to to really deal with some things because we needed the training. And I'm telling you, when I started training, that's when everything changed to the point where today my wife has told me, there is nothing you need to do. You are perfect in every way now. (laughs) She's never said that once in my life, all right? I'm still still training because I have to continue to train for the rest of my life. And some of us, all we're doing is trying can I ask you what seems like a silly question? Come on. Why would we believe that we can grow in our faith by trying versus training when that strategy doesn't work in any other area of our life? First Timothy chapter four, verse seven through eight. Paul's talking to Timothy about how to become the godly man that he wants to be. He says, Timothy, rather train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. Now listen, he says to be godly. We don't train ourselves to be made right or to have salvation with God. When we talked about this last weekend, you don't earn forgiveness from God. It is a free gift. You don't train or try to earn God's forgiveness. You're, it is a free gift. But once you become a follower of Jesus, you go all in, you're baptized, now the training begins. We are to train to be godly, he goes on to say this, for physical training is of some value, and someone needs to hear that today, because you work out at the gym every day, and you're ripped. That only has some value, listen to this, but godliness has value, training for godliness has value in all things, holding promise not only for the present life, but also the life to come. And that is why at CCV, our greatest Goal is not that you just decide to follow Jesus. Listen, for those of you, 1,103 people that that were baptized last weekend, our goal is not that you get baptized and call it good. Our goal is that you now begin the process of training to become everything God wants you to be. And that is why our mission at CCV is win, train, send. We exist to win people to Christ, to train people, uh, believers to become disciples, and then to send people to impact the world, your home, your city, your workplace, and the world. And that is why when you log onto our website or you open up our app, which by the way, I hope every single person has the app or you're on the website, when you log in, we actually have kind of a Fitbit for your faith. You know, you, you track a lot of things through, you know, apps, We have a Fitbit for your faith, which is a progression of next steps that we think will help you grow in your faith. And you can log on yourself and see where you're at in your next steps. So let me just quickly walk through some next steps we think grow you in your faith, that you go to starting point and learn, that you're you're baptized, you you go, this is your commit, go all in with Jesus. But then you don't stop there, right? You, You begin to Attend church regularly, like you're here every weekend, and, and at home, you're, you're reading the Bible and, and praying and growing, and then you join a group. You cannot grow as a follower of Jesus until you surround yourself with a group of other people that sharpen you, because the Bible says iron sharpens iron, one, one man sharpens another. Then you begin to serve and use your gifts, and that really helps you grow in your faith, and then you begin to give, because until God becomes first place with your finances, you'll, trust me, you'll never grow in your faith. That will always hold you back. And then you begin to share your faith and really invite others. And then you start coaching. You begin to be a leader. You lead others along their journey. Listen, this isn't linear in its progression. You can start anywhere, but these are the things that grow you in your faith. And we want that for every person. And what someone here needs to hear is that you have been trying, you have not been training. And it has you stuck. Remember, remember, trying cannot match the power of training. So someone here is gonna be challenged, take your next step. Take your next step. Take your next step. That's the first reason people get stuck. Here's the second reason. God intended our training to engage our whole selves. So what I mean by that is, to think about it this way, to engage our head, our heart, 
and our hands. And we get stuck, listen, we get stuck when we overtrain one of those areas and neglect the others. Listen to how clear Jesus is when talking about how we should grow in our faith, our love for him. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 says this, the words of Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus makes it so clear that if you wanna grow in your faith, you have to engage your whole self. And I wanna make this really simple for us today. I'm gonna give you a graphic that just shows you how we train in our faith. Watch this. We train our head, right? We love the Lord your God with all your mind. Your head represents your mind and your intelligence and and growing, right, reading God's word and, and letting it sink into your mind and permeate your mind and knowing more about God. But we can't stop there. It has to sink into our heart. Our heart is the center of our emotions. We love the Lord your God with all your heart. Let what you learn sink into your heart so that your heart and your feelings and what directs your life, it aligns with what you know about God's word. But we don't just train our, our, our head and our heart. Then it has to go to our hands. We have to apply it to our lives. We love the Lord your God with all your strength. Your hands represent your strength and your will and your actions. And I'm telling you that people get stuck when you overtrain in one of these areas and all of us have a tendency to lean in one of these areas more than the other. I do. I know which one is mine, okay? I have a tendency to lean in one area and it can get us stuck. It reminds me of when I was in high school. When I was in high school, I had this guy that he decided that he was gonna just train his upper body. That's it. He wanted to get ripped because you know guys were like all about the chest and biceps and so, and he did it. I'm telling you, he actually went on steroids. He, he, he told me personally, I'm on steroids. He just built his upper body. It's all he worked out and he never worked his lower body. And he looked so weird. <laughs> I mean, honestly, he was like the Hulk up top with like little baby stick legs below. And he'd walk up to me and he'd be like, Ashley, look at these. And I didn't say this, but I'm thinking, bro, your legs, your legs, man, it looks so weird. And I'm telling you, some of us, we're just out of balance. We're out of balance with our faith. I wanna talk to you about three types of Christians that get out of balance, okay? And I want you to ask yourself, which of these do I relate with the most? Because you're, you're gonna find one that you relate with. You ready? Here's in balance Christian number one. It's the feed me more Christian. This is the person that overtrains in head knowledge. It's all about what they gotta know. And what happens with this person is this is someone focused on knowing more about the Bible versus applying what they already know. You know that person that's like, I just gotta be fed more. I mean, it's almost like, you know those little, like when, when birds are babies and mom comes to the nest and they're just like this, like, like oh, feed me, ha, 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 ha. There's a bunch of Christians walking around like this, feed me, feed me. And we talked about this a little bit during the, in the prodigal series, but I'm gonna take it a step further. Think in terms of training. If you read every book on training and working out, but you never worked out, are you gonna grow? How about this, the feed me. If you just sat down and ate more all the time, is that gonna get you in shape? Couldn't that make you fat? Could it be that we have a lot of overweight Christians running around because they're way too focused on all the head knowledge they gotta gain? I'm gonna make some really strong statements, so just hang with me, okay? Think about it this way. More Bible knowledge does not automatically correlate with spiritual growth. and I can prove it, from scripture. Who in the Bible in Jesus' day knew the most about the Bible? Say it out loud, who knew the most about the Bible? Say it out loud if you know it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew the Bible more than anybody. They had memorized, most of them, the first five books of the Bible. They had it memorized, and yet who 
fought with Jesus the most and disobeyed him the most? The Pharisees. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, you are the least spiritual people in the room, the people that knew the most about the Bible. So that proves to us knowing more does not equal spiritual growth. What does? Living it out, applying what you know. That's why the book of James says this. Do not merely listen to the word and kind of like, ah, I know it all. And so deceive yourselves. What are we to do? Do what it says. Live it out. Why? You want to know what correlates to spiritual growth? Not Bible knowledge. Bible application. Bible application is directly correlated with spiritual growth. And some of us just need to hear this. We focus so hard on knowing more, we've forgotten to actually live out what we already know. Remember my truck getting stuck in the sand, just spinning the wheels? You wanna know how I got out of the sand? Literally, like someone came up out of nowhere and said, looks like you're stuck. I'm like, duh, do you think? I mean, my tires are like way in the sand. They said, let me tell you how to get unstuck. And this blew my mind. They said, do you, do you know how to get stuck? And I was like, I have no idea. This guy actually did races in like those off-road races. He said, the way to get unstuck is you actually let air out of your tires. I was like, what? I thought he was like messing with me for a second. He goes, no, when you let a little air out of your tires, your tires are so puffed up that it's just spinning through the sand. When you let a little air out of your tires, the tire can actually grip the sand and it propels you out. And that's exactly what I did. I sat there and let air out of my tires, tire, air out of my tires, you know, got out of the sand. Think about this spiritually. Some of us are so puffed up with knowledge, with little application that we are spinning Listen to what scripture says about just focusing on knowledge. Watch this, 1 Corinthians chapter eight, one through three. But knowledge, knowledge puffs up. It puffs you up and makes you think you're a big person. Oh, I know a lot. I know more of the Bible than you and you and you. Who cares? Knowledge puffs up while love, which what is love? Love is action. Love builds up. Those who think they know something do not know as they ought to know, but whoever loves, applies it, lives it on their life, that is someone that is known by God, approved by God. <laughs> I'm convinced, I am convinced, <laughs> most Christians are educated beyond their level of obedience. And so many of us are just like, feed me, feed me, feed me. Maybe we should focus on applying and living out what we already know. And by the way, this is why you just need to know at CCV, this is why we teach the way we do. We teach very specifically to inspire you to go apply what you learn, not just to learn. Do you understand if I just wanted you to know something, do you understand how easy that would be for me to preach? It would actually cut my sermon preparation time in half. I spend about 20 hours a week on sermon preparation. If I just wanted you to know something, oh, I could do that in my sleep. Mark and I could do that easy. I mean, I would just get up here and like impress you with all my Bible knowledge and facts and historical information and context. I would Greek and Hebrew you to death. <laughs> I would, I would exegete every passage and you know what you do? You get done with the service and you go, whoa, that was meaty. That guy's really smart. I don't want you to think I'm smart. I want you to take God's word and apply it to your life. That's why I teach, and that's why Mark and our teaching team, that's why we teach the way we do. Because we don't want you to just know more, we want you to apply more, because that's the only way your life will change. And I'm telling you, I got stuck here. I got stuck here personally. When I was in Bible college, I got stuck. Sophomore year of Bible college, I was really stuck because I was so focused on all the head knowledge I was gaining, I forgot to live it out. And I was not living it out. I almost turned into a Pharisee myself. And I'm convinced that we have a lot of Pharisees running around in churches today who just wanna know more. And they go to church and they're just like, feed me. And I wanna tell some people that say, feed me, I wanna go, are you telling me you're 100% obedient to everything you've learned this past year? Let's focus on application, not just head knowledge, or we will always get stuck. Okay, anybody feel uncomfortable a little bit? 
We're gonna move on, Pastor UK. We're gonna talk about what to do if you're the feed me Christian all the time. But let's move on to the opposite end of the spectrum, okay? The opposite end of the spectrum from the feed me Christian is the feelings-focused Christian. This is the person that has an over-reliance on their emotion and feelings. In other words, this is someone focused on listening to their heart and their feelings versus the truth of God's word. You ever, you ever seen this, someone who just listens to their heart all the time? 1988, Roxette wrote a song <laughs> that you know, listen to this. Listen to your heart yeah. when he's for you. Next line, this is good. Listen to your heart. There's nothing else you can do. Are you kidding me? Like nothing else you can do? Hey, how about listen to a friend? How about listen to a parent? Hey, how about instead of listening to your heart, you listen to God's word? What if your heart and what it tells you to do doesn't align with God's word? What are you gonna do then? Have you ever listened to your heart and made a really stupid decision? <laughs> Nervous laughter. That's all of us, right? You ever, you ever like spring break? Huh? That dating relationship? He's the one. I know it. My heart tells me. Oh, what happened? Weird, you know? That financial pur pur purchase. My heart was just telling me this is the right thing to do. For those of you that listen to your heart way too much, let me give you a little Bible. <laughs> let me give you a little God's word, okay? Jeremiah 17, nine. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, who can understand it? <laughs> you listen to your heart, you're gonna be tr in trouble your whole life. And that's where some of you are. Can I quote Paula Abdul in church, is that okay? <laughs> of this quote, she says, break the rules, stand apart, ignore your head, and follow your heart. Really, Paula? We are told, listen, you need to know this, you are told all day long to follow your heart. And the Bible says the exact opposite, that your heart is deceitful. It will trick you all the time. In fact, I looked at this, this People magazine, I followed my heart, Bachelorette. Weird those don't work out all the time, it's so weird. I like this shirt. My head says gym, but my heart says tacos. I'm going tacos. I'm going tacos. You have to align your heart with God's word. And if you over rely on your heart, you're emotion driven, you're always seeking the next spiritual high, you, you want everything to feel good, you'll always find yourself stuck in your faith. You'll find yourself stuck in life. Can I be honest? There's times I don't feel like loving my wife. And sometimes I have to get over my feelings because God commanded me in scripture to lay down my life for my wife as Christ died for the church. I, that's what I have to do as a husband. I can't listen to my feelings all the time. You wanna know why? Your feelings aren't facts. Let me say that again. Your feelings are not facts. I mean, what other area of your life do you get to just say, well, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like driving on the right-hand side of the road today. <laughs> I don't feel like paying my taxes, right? I don't feel like feeding the baby this week. Try that for a week. <laughs> I mean, seriously, what, when do we just get to like listen to our feelings and do whatever we want? If you do this, I'm telling you, this is some of you and it's got you stuck in your faith and you wonder why, because you need to balance your heart with your head and what you know about God's word, okay? That's the feelings focused Christians. We'll talk about that, what to do about that a little later on. Let's go to the last one, because some of you are like, ooh, that might be me, let's move on, okay? All right, <laughs> um, here it is, last one, okay? The look good on the outside Christian. This is someone who over focuses on the hands versus really thinking about the heart. And this is someone that does this. It's someone focused on doing all the right things, but sometimes for the wrong reasons. Let me, let me give you an example. For, I'll just talk to the married guys for a second. If you're a married guy here today, have you ever done something during the day for your wife and your whole motive 
was so you could get something at night from her. That's nervous laughter in the room. That's nervous. Some of you, don't elbow him, ladies, because I could point the finger right back at you. Your motives aren't pure all the time either, okay? But isn't it true that sometimes, sometimes we, we do things on the outside with a motive to just kind of impress others or for us? And I, I think this happens all the time in our faith, and sometimes we wanna gain the approval of others. We might serve in a certain area because it's visible, we wanna impress others. Sometimes we give a big check and we actually tell people about it. As we want people to think on the outside we're, we're awesome. You know, sometimes we can say all the right things to someone's face and in, in, in our heart we're thinking, that guy's a jerk. Sometimes we post things on social media, come on, that make us look so like spiritual and we're really dealing with something behind the scenes. I mean, we're just putting on a show. Isn't it true, come on, isn't it true that on the outside things can look meticulous but on the inside be a little mess? This is why you, you, you can't just focus on looking good as a Christian. I mean, some of us walked into church today and on the way to church, we're driving screaming at our kids and family, you shut up, you shut up. Oh, pull in the parking lot. Okay, everybody get your happy face on. We're going into church. We're going to worship Jesus, okay? Everybody look good. I mean, I've, I've done that, right? I mean, it's like we just get so outward focused and we just miss dealing with some things on the inside. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 23. He said, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees. They were so outward focused. He said, you clean the outside of the cup. So outward focused, but you don't care about the inside. So Jesus says, you got it mixed up. Deal with the inside, clean the inside first, and then the outside will, will be better. Listen, out of your heart flows so many of your actions, and, and if you don't deal with the things in your heart, you'll, you'll get stuck in your faith. You'll be, you'll, you'll, you'll be a doer. You're doing things. You're like doing all the right things, but your heart's not quite there. I like what the book of Proverbs says, 423. It says, above all else, above all else, you better guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. And if you find yourself outwardly looking good, but, but behind closed doors really struggling, it likely means that you have some heart work to do. You've undertrained with your heart and you've overtrained with your hands. I've been there as a pastor. I wanna be transparent. I, I've had times like I feel like maybe I'm like doing all the right things, but I have some heart work to do. I mean, there's times I've been preparing for a message, very honestly, and I've had to call my wife and apologize because I don't wanna outwardly project something and not deal with some things going on in my heart. Three kinds of Christians that have overtrained. Did any one of those spark something inside you? Maybe you're the feed me more, got a no head knowledge. Maybe you're the feelings focused person. You're way listening to your heart way too much or maybe you're the gotta look good on the outside. What area of your life have you been overtraining? It's got you stuck. I wanna give you an answer of how to get a little unstuck, okay? It's just a starting point. But here's my challenge today is that Whatever area you pick, and I know what mine is, okay? Whatever area you pick, let me, let me give you some challenges today of, of how to apply this, how to do something with this message, okay? Number one, let's say you're the head person. You've overtrained in the head. It's all about feed me, I gotta know more. I wanna challenge you to start putting your faith into action. Are you serving in an area of ministry? Are you giving, like are you giving a tithe? Like really, is God first in your finances? Are you wanna just know more? Do you, do you need to start sharing your faith? When's the last time you invited someone to church? You shared your faith with someone versus just knowing the Bible more. Start focusing on application. And here's what I would say. I'm convinced as a pastor, I would rather have someone that knows one verse in the Bible and is applying it to their life than someone that knows the entire Bible and isn't doing anything with it. Gotta live it out, live it out. How about this? Let's say you're the, the heart-focused person. You know you just kind of follow your heart and you make decisions based on gut feeling all the time. This kind of messed you up. Why not spend a period of time really focusing on God's word? Like join, you, you need to get into a CCV group and really 
get into God's word. You need every morning or every day at a certain time, you say, I'm gonna get into God's word. I'm gonna let God's word permeate my heart so that I don't make decisions based on what my heart's telling me to do and it doesn't line up with God's word. Lastly, let's say you're the person that's kind of hands. You're, you're doing all the right things. You look good on the outside, but there's some stuff going on in your heart. My challenge to you today would be, why not get into a time of confession? Maybe there's some hidden sins that are leaking in your heart right now, and you might need to confess that to a spouse or to a trusted friend and say, I wanna just share what's going on in my heart. I haven't shared this with anybody. And that confession will begin to heal your heart. You might need to start doing things with proper motives. You know, don't, don't do things to be seen by others. Do them to just live for an audience of one, live for God. Here's what I know. Most of us have been overtraining in an area and it's got us stuck. And you can get unstuck when you begin to train holistically. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let it balance, move forward. And you know what? You know what's on the line for some of us today? It's not just you growing in your faith. You know what's on the line? It's your marriage. It's your kids. It's a relationship. It's you being effective in your workplace. It's you making a difference with your life. You have to grow in your faith. And we want that for everyone here at CCV. So let's, let's take the challenge to start growing. As we go throughout this series, I think God's gonna do a great work in our life. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for the challenge that we need to not try. We gotta get to training. And some of us, we just realize we've not been training in our faith or we've been overtraining in an area. We're kind, of, we're kind of like that guy that looks buff in one area and we got skinny legs. And God, you're, you're challenging us to start living out our faith in a way that, that we really can make a difference. We don't lean into one direction or another, but God, we take our head, our heart, and our hands and together we go make a difference for you. God, challenge any of us today that need to, to have a reorientation in our training. Help us to do that and do it well for your glory and your sake. Would you, would you bless this time and just the courage and boldness for people today, what they're gonna do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I think as you could tell from Ashley's message today, this series, Big Questions, is gonna be a powerful series. I encourage you, be here each and every week uh, as we continue in this series, Big Questions. For those of you that are new with us here at CCV, or maybe last weekend at Easter was your first weekend, if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, swing by our new to CCV tables. We'd love to meet you and uh, get, to, get to know a little bit about your story right out here in the courtyard as you leave service. Uh, next week, also, for those of you that are newer to CCV, if you've never been to Starting Point, uh, it's an incredible opportunity to learn more about our core beliefs as a church, our strategy as a church to reach this city. And for those of you who are just kind of starting off in your faith. We also talk about what those first initial steps look like in getting our faith started off in the right direction. And uh, if you were here last weekend and you're thinking about, man, I'm ready to, I'm ready to give my life to Christ and to be baptized, but you weren't quite ready to make that decision last week, if that's something you've continued to think about and you are ready to do that, come find us at the tables out here in the courtyard as well, as we'd love to help you with that next step. Have a great rest of your Saturday and your weekend. We'll see you all next week.